The idea um, of coming today was to honour what has been established already, but in doing so I wanted to take some time to take you through what community foundations are all about. Uh, I was going to give you a little bit of a, an update on what the Tyndall Foundation was up to, but John's actually very eloquently already told you. Uh, what I would ask you to do if you are interested in what we do is to, to have a look on our website, the Tyndall Foundation website, which will tell you a lot more about the sorts of endeavours that we support. But um, the, one of the most important ones that we do support is, is uh, actually supporting and promoting generosity. Excuse me. And it's really with that in mind that um, I thought it was very important that we talked today about community foundations. Community foundations have actually been going exactly a hundred years this month. In fact, the, the, um, the oldest one, which is based in the United States, has its um, centenary later in October. And um, I was invited to go up there, but unfortunately can't. But I was really pleased that it timed itself really well with what's happening here with you at the Sunrise Foundation. Because um, you pretty much kick off 100 years after the whole movement started. The Tyndall Foundation has sort of looked around the world at types of generosity that work. And when we discovered this about 15 years ago in the States, we thought it was something that was really worth supporting and promoting. And the way it works is that communities support themselves in a local place-based organisation. Um, it's not for others from the outside to support you or for you to support people from the outside. It's all about the people of Gisborne and this region supporting yourselves going forward on a long-term basis. And John used the word forever, and, and that is really exactly what it's about. Uh, and so let me explain a little bit more about what, hap what has been happening. The New Zealand movement has sort of taken its own genesis. And uh, probably the best example of a community foundation is now the Tauranga branch. Um, and this particular organisation has really made an effort to raise money from people who are looking to decide what to do with their wills. So it's not actual cash that comes in straight away. Um, that does happen from time to time and that has built very, very well. But the Acorn Foundation down in Tauranga, sorry, up in Tauranga from here, <laughs> have, have actually put together a way of, of explaining to people about how they can contribute to their local community in the future and forever. And the way they put it, I think, is, is really unique. And that is, when they're talking to people that are thinking about what they're going to do with their wills, they say to them, if you give 90% of what you have to your family, what does that last 10% the, the of your estate really matter? And the example that I've heard on numerous occasions, which I think is a great one, is that if you had, say, an estate of a million dollars, and you had, say, two children, if they got half each, it's, uh, it's 500,000. If they got 90%, it's 450,000. And it's still a very large amount of money. And, and the way this has been tested and the way it's been proven in that local community has been quite enormous to the extent that the Acorn Foundation now have promises of around $160 million from their local wider community. And this is only in probably 10 years. Um, a lot of the, the community foundations that we've helped support have actually struggled to get going, and they were no exception. They actually started and then they, they fell over, and then they, like a phoenix, they rose out of the ashes. Others that we've helped support um, Ash Burton's probably quite a good example, has been one where a dedicated group of trustees, uh, some from farming backgrounds, some from the local town, decided like you have here in Gisborne to really put together 
a group of trustees that would put their money where their mouth was and got, get the thing started. And we've always encouraged that you, it's very difficult to go and ask, for pe ask people for money if you don't participate yourself. And there's no way I'd be standing here tonight speaking to you unless you know, I'd participated myself in, in giving. And so, um, for example, uh, what happened down in Ashburton, because I think it's another great example, is they've gone out into their community after they, as trustees, have been an example, and talked to people who might want to give uh, at, at their death. And um, they've had two dairy farmers that have promised their, that they don't have any really close descendants, and they've promised their dairy farms to that local foundation. Now those, those dairy farms are worth you know, in excess of six and a half million dollars each, probably today a lot more. There was a chap actually up in, in Tauranga um, at the Acorn Foundation the other day, and I, I went along to support this particular event, who was a, an undertaker, who actually had two undertaking businesses. And he donated his second one, um, funnily enough, the more profitable one, to the local funding community foundation. And the profits from that, while he's still alive, is going, going in there. Now the way it works is that if you give while you're still alive, the money that you want to go to anything at all in your local community is actually given on the basis of the interest that is generated from that money. So it is an endowment fund. And usually it's 5% of the fund. Acorn now, I believe, have donations and money in the bank of a rough, a roughly 30 million. So they're able to give away quite a substantial amount of money. Once, of course, time goes by and the 160 million or more comes in, they can give, give away more. But the, what happens is that a, a gift goes to whoever they decide they want to give it to. And so if, if I, for example, decided I want, wanted my gifts to go to, say, the woman's refuge, um, maybe my local, my local church, um, possibly um, something to do with, with young people, with children, something to do with youth employment, then those proportions would be given on an annual basis every year to those organisations forever. And what happens is a card is given to either the, the living givers or their descendants every year saying this amount of money went to that organisation this year um, and it reminds them every year of the great that either their forebearers or, or their parents or, or in fact um, themselves have given to those organisations. So it's a fantastic way of getting people involved in their local communities but also putting something aside that will live forever in, in their local catchment or the place in which they've resided. So I think it's an, an unbelievable way of actually helping what the Tyndall Foundation really stands for, and that's a, a hand up, not a hand out. Um, and as John mentioned, we've, we've been doing this sort of work now for 20 years, so it's 20 years since we started our foundation. It, it coincided with the floating of the warehouse in 1994. And at that point, we decided we wanted to make sure that the sort of um, contributions that were being made geographically to the company around the, around the country were actually returned to those catchments in some shape or form on a hand up, not a handout basis. And that's why um, we have had a local allocations committee here, what we call a funding manager in Gisborne for many years. What we believe is that people who actually live and work on the ground in local communities understand much more about their community than we do, based in one place up in Takapuna, and so can make decisions on, a, on the basis of, of need, on the basis of who deserves the right sort of hand up, and therefore our money goes through local allocation committees um, by and large. We also have picked off some rather big endeavours that we wanted to see see start to work and so community foundations are one that we were very very proud of but we've also got involved of late with some of the more pressing needs in New Zealand so around affordable housing 
Uh, housing, as you know, is, is almost now out of reach of, of young people. And so we've, we've supported a group called the New Zealand Housing Foundation and helped them get started. They've been going about 15 years or so. They have either built or have in process 750 homes. Some of you may or may not have um, seen an article that was uh, on television last week on uh, the John Campbell show uh, explaining what, what happens. Uh, they, they managed to actually uh, buy land and through various means using local builders build a house for around about 80% of market and then they help people into those homes either on a rent to buy basis or, a, or on a shared equity basis. Um, and we've got a lot of people into homes that would never have got there before. We do believe that home ownership is a great way of beating poverty. Um, when you have a look at poverty in New Zealand, with people that rent, they move a lot, they're very transient, their kids never go to the same schools for, any, for a, length of, a, a, a good length of time. And so that's one endeavour that we're also very proud of. We do a lot of work in the early years section. So we work very closely with Plunkett. Uh, we have paid for almost every Plunkett nurse now in New Zealand to go through a special course to identify need within, within homes. And to, uh, to identify if anything might look like there could be some abuse going on and so then referring it to the right, to the right agencies. Uh, of late, particularly in some catchments, we've been particularly concerned with uh, youth unemployment. And so we've, we've got involved in a couple of, of quite interesting youth employment schemes. I think we probably try to use our entrepreneurial type of approach um, and innovation to look at how we can deal with things different, in a different way to the way that the government might do it. Uh, a couple that I'd like to mention uh, is in South Auckland, we were told about the county's Manukau DHB, which basically runs the Middlemore Hospital, where they have 7,000 employees and a churn of 10% per year. So 700 new jobs every year are created. Most of those jobs were being taken by health professionals that have been trained overseas. And we thought, why is it? that there's this very large number of young people in South Auckland, Pacific Island and Maori, who could easily do those jobs. And so we searched uh, around the world for models to see whether there was anyone else doing this. One of the other organisations I helped set up a few years ago is called KIA, the Kiwi Expat Association. And I just happened to be giving a speech in New York uh, around about eight years ago. and. A guy came up to me afterwards, he was a, an expat, a New Zealander, who had done exactly this in New York. And so we brought him down to New Zealand and we studied the best model to see if we could kick something off. Uh, and I'm really pleased to say it's been so far incredibly successful. So we, we, what he told us was, you've got to start with kids at year 11. If you try to actually do it after they've left school, it's too late. And so we started with three schools. We started three health academies and three South Auckland schools. At the moment, it's 94% Pacific Island children. And we're into our fourth year, so the first cohort are now at university. Every one of those 450 kids that are in the program have a guaranteed health job at the county's Manukau DHB. And it's guaranteed on the basis, obviously, that they pass their exams. But the way that it worked, which I think is remarkable, is that we took the families, so the parents and the kids, along to the hospital, and we said to them, you could do this job. There's absolutely no reason why you kids in year 11 couldn't start to learn how to be a health professional, a nurse, an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, whatever. And by the way, the jobs pay sixty to $70,000 a year. Well, you know, the lights went on not only with the kids but with the parents and you know it was quite remarkable very quickly we had all these kids signing up wanting to do it um, so that's been a so far a great success and I think in the same way as Sunrise is, is, uh, is working here what we're all about is long term we're looking for solutions that that don't just come and go we're looking for things that will be here for many many decades and I can see that um, Counties Manukau, DHB and um, the Middlemore Hospital 
in years to come, you know, for decades and decades, we'll now start to have local people staffing their hospitals for the patients that are in there, which pretty much are their, you know, their parents, their grandparents and, and their relations. The other one that we, we helped get start um, three years ago was uh, in the poorer areas of, of Auckland City, just after the super city was formed. Uh, we've got 31 local boards in Auckland. And again, a very large proportion of unemployed or not untrained um, youth. Uh, so the, there are actually at the moment in Auckland 24,000 in that category. 24,000. And it's a huge problem and it's like sort of the, the elephant in the room. How do you tackle something so big? Uh, well, I'm, I'm pleased to say that through our funding and some funding from the Auckland City Council, we've now got seven local boards all focused on putting employers with kids. And I guess it's, uh, it's, it's the economics base uh, in me that says, you know, if you've got demand, then why can't you supply? It's no good saying, let's educate a whole lot of kids for jobs that might be there. As we know, you know, that, um, I was just looking at some statistics this morning. Um, the, the Auckland University uh, train a huge number of, of law students massive number, only 10% of those get jobs in law. So why do we keep doing this? It's much better to say where's the demand and then let's train those kids into those particular positions. And so that's what we're doing. We've been out, so far we've spoken to over um, a thousand employers. You know, New Zealand is the land of SMEs, so about 94% of New Zealand employers and businesses uh, in the SME sector, and they're the people we're focusing on. And we're saying to them, how can we plan ahead for these kids? Where's the demand in your business? If it's not this year, if it's not next year, what are you going to be doing in the next five years? So that we can train people, particularly young people, who will actually fill the bill for you. I think it's, you know, it's been too long as employers, and I'm one of them, you know, 11,000 people work for the, the warehouse, warehouse stationery in Noel Leeming and some of our online businesses. But we've, we've had the luxury for many years is that if we wanted somebody, you know, we'd put an ad in the paper or we'd go on seek, seek and we'd find someone. It's got to be different. From now on we've got to say let's plan this so that we can actually employ our own people and let's put in place a program that enables them to train for those jobs so there's something meaningful for them there in the end. So, <clears throat> there's just some examples of the things that, that we found work, and I'm sure that uh, your trustees of the Sunrise Foundation are going to find things that they can recommend to local people that will work really well for Gisborne. I just wanted to congratulate um, the trustees of the, of the Sunrise Foundation because unlike some of those that have sort of faltered a little bit in the past, uh, this foundation is built on incredibly strong foundation. If you have a look at the people behind it, uh, if you have a look at the, the research they've done, if you listen to what John's going to tell you in, in a few minutes, I'm sure you'll all agree with me that this Sunrise Foundation, you know, when we're well dead and buried, will be going from strength to strength for this local community. And for that, I'd like to, put, to um, get you to all put your hands together and congratulate them for what they've achieved already. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me down here. Someone said, what was the flight like? And I can tell you it was, didn't feel like a flight at all. It was like, uh, like um, a stone uh, flopping along the, the bottom of the seabed. It was very, very rough. Anyway, Thanks very much, John. <laughs>